I'm going to turn this morning in God's Word to the book of Psalms one more time. Over the last six weeks or so, we've been looking at these psalms of confession, psalms of, of uh, penitence. They're sometimes called the series of psalms that the church has turned to throughout its history to say these are psalms that help us to express our longing for God's forgiveness and redemption, our need for a Savior. And this morning, we read a psalm that is given really as an answer to some of those longings that we have Psalm 16 is called a miktam of David. Now, a lot of these words, uh, literary titles, we don't really know exactly what they mean. Uh, commentators have suggested that it's related to words that have to do with a motto or a refrain, an inscription, something like that. And, um, you know, of course, it's kind of a guess on their part, but um, I, I do think it's got something to it. As you read this this morning, there's a number of phrases that you could pull out of here, and, and maybe you could do that even the, for yourself today and this week. Circle a couple of phrases in your Bible and highlight them this week when you're looking for encouragement, when you're looking for reminder of the significance of Easter in this time when everything's kind of confusing and up in the air. Um, things that you can pull out and say, yes, this is what I believe. Hear God's word to us this morning from Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out my, their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends of Jesus, it's Easter Sunday today, but there are a lot of ways that it doesn't really feel like it. Well, just be honest, right? Easter is normally the one day of the year, besides Christmas, that churches are full. It's a day full of celebration and hope, a day full of, full of victory in life, a day of vibrant color and energy. But not this year. There's really no congregation here this morning, just a handful of people to run the service and, and so we can hear the words of the songs. There's no one to answer the great cry of the church that we traditionally open with. The Lord is risen, he is risen indeed. The great Easter hymns, the beautiful music that we love singing here at Fairlawn and in a number of other churches around the country. Well, those are songs that you're going to have to sing on your own at home this year. And as for hope and joy, well, you know all too well the anxiety and fear and death that hangs in the news this Easter Sunday. It may be Easter Sunday, but in many ways it doesn't feel like it. And yet, and yet it's helpful for us to remember that this is not the first dismal Easter Sunday that the church has ever faced. I kind of like history. We have a couple of history teachers in our congregation. And so I, I thought back to what it would be to be celebrating Easter, for example, in Western Europe in March of 1940. Knowing that the world is about to be at war, in fact, officially it is, even though it hasn't really broken out in Western Europe yet, and yet having no idea how long or severe or deep or dark the suffering of the next few years would be. Or I think back further in history, and I try to imagine what it would be like to celebrate Easter in the city of Constantinople in the year 1453, in April of that year. As they gathered for worship that day, they knew that on the hillsides around the walls of the city were gathering the armies of the Ottoman Empire that would soon besiege the city and in the next month would conquer it and would remove it from its place, this Constantinople from its place as the seat of Eastern Christianity and make it instead the capital of a Muslim empire. And of course, we could go all the way back to that first Easter as well, to the disciples who heard about the resurrection but still retreated, we're told, behind locked doors for fear of the religious leaders. 
In fact, we read in the time of confession this morning, they were, fear was so great that the doors were still locked a week later. We look at these kinds of experiences and we say so much for Easter hope and joy. And so I think we find ourselves in decent company this morning, gathered for a day of hope and joy in the midst of a time of fear and uncertainty. And in some ways, this simply mirrors where we've been the last six weeks or so with these prayers of confession, these psalms of confession. As we've been looking at this fact that there's a sin that infects our hearts more deeply than any virus ever could. The Bible puts it in quite frank terms. Thursday night, we read from Psalm 143. And we heard this truth. There is no one living who is righteous before you, O God. There's no one, in other words, who can stand in your presence. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 2, you were dead, dead in your transgressions and sins. But what Easter does is to show us the other side of the grave, the other side of sin and death for all who take refuge in the triumph God. And that's where Psalm 16 leads us. It begins with a great call of trust and hope. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I think about that word refuge. And I think we're learning a few things in these last couple of weeks about refuge. Refuge is being stuck in your homes, trying to stay out of the virus's way, this one place where the virus cannot reach. Or for those who are on the front lines, knowing that hazardous things are out there in the, way, in the world, longing perhaps for a place of refuge, for a place of safety, for a place where you don't have to worry about getting sick or getting others sick. Now, of course, David is not facing coronavirus as he writes this psalm. We don't actually know what prompted him to write these words. But it's obviously, from what he's writing, it's, it's some kind of a situation in his life that causes him to reflect on his own vulnerability and therefore to also cause him to reflect on his mortality, his, to be sensitive to his own sin and his standing before God. Keep me safe, O oh God. Give me refuge. And what we're going to do this morning is to look at three forms of insecurity that we find in these verses and in our lives. Three threats on this side of the grave which drive David to the security of God and ultimately, as he looks forward, to the security of the risen Savior that God would give. First, David looks for refuge from the wrong crowd. He recognizes the threat of throwing in your lot with the wrong crowd. Now, I think we, we understand what's going on with this kind of thing these days, don't we? You know, you read about the virus and you read about all the different responses and, and you start reading the news and your head wants to spin after a while and you're saying, well, what should I believe? Should I follow those who want to do what's happening in Sweden or, or should I follow those who want to sh- shelter in place? Is it better to flatten the curve or is it better to work on herd immunity? And each one of these things requires sacrifice. Each one promises deliverance. And while our daily choices in life may not always seem quite as stark or significant, every day we make decisions based on the competing narratives of our world. Just listen sometime to the corporate or, or, or political slogans, advertisements that come on television. They're inviting us to follow a certain crowd. Go with the people who are eating at this restaurant because this restaurant will make you happy. I know you can't do that right now, but someday hopefully we'll be able to do it again. Follow this political party because this is the one who will make you, make your life better, who will improve things in our country and our state. And David is wrestling with some of that. He states his faith in the very first verses, in verse 2 and 3, by saying that the Lord and the Lord alone is a source of hope and joy. And in stating his faith this way, he says, I recognize that this is putting me with a certain crowd, those he calls the saints in the land. That's where my delight, I enjoy being in their presence. And I think for those who, for whom following Jesus and being a part of his church is important, you feel the presence, that that importance all the more now as, as we are missing out on those opportunities. But even as David says this, he recognizes the danger that he needs to name, that there's a temptation to put our trust in other stories, other gods who bring sorrow and disappointment, even as they promise rich rewards to those who sacrifice to them. God, I don't want to put my lot in with them, he says. I don't want to fall into the wrong story. 
I don't want to fall into the wrong crowd and get swept away by what they're doing and not be able to see you, to see what you are doing. Because on this kind of the grave, there's always one more crowd to throw our lot in with. And so we need to repeat again. This is the story that gives my life hope and meaning. The only story that matters is the one that makes the Lord, the covenant God who saved his people from slavery in Egypt and who delivers us from sin through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to make him our God and declare our delight in being among his people. What David says is there is shelter. There is refuge in going to that story, into that crowd this, with this God. He also recognizes a second temptation in this side of the grave. And it's related to the first. It's a threat, I'm going to call it this morning, the threat of viewing our lives through the wrong perspective. The threat of the wrong perspective. David says, I need refuge, I need shelter from thinking about life the wrong way. And it's sort of related to the first because if you're thinking about life the wrong way, then you're going to be tempted to throw yourself in with the wrong crowd. And yet there is a difference about this too, right? There, so one sometimes is sort of instinctive and the other one you actually have to think about. And so David says, I want to make sure I'm thinking straight too. And again, there's plenty of commentary these days in the way that perspective shapes the approach to combating coronavirus. As long as it's just a threat to older adults, college kids will go to Florida and continue to party for spring break. As long as it's nothing more serious than the flu, People will be slow to self-quarantine and won't take extra measures to stop the spread of the virus. But you know what? We do the same thing with sin. We have our slogans, we have our perspectives, we have our ways of thinking about life that lead us to mistakenly say it's not as big a deal as it really is. We look at life and we say, well, everyone's doing it. It's no big deal. Will God really be upset about this? As long as my motives are in the right place, how can he complain? Or then when it comes to fixing the problem, we look at that and we say, well, you know, I'm really not much worse than the next person. I I could probably fix this myself. And so it's important to name our perspective aloud so that we can intentionally orient our lives toward God's truth. And that's what David does in the middle verses of this psalm. Starting in verse 5, he says, Lord, you have assigned me my portion and cup. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Lord, what's happening to me right now, as difficult as it is, no matter how I feel, I need shelter. It's not out of your control. It's not surprising you. You assigned it. Now, that may seem like an odd thing to say under the present circumstances. I mean, most of us in North America are accustomed to getting what we want, when we want it, where we want it. And so suddenly being limited to a dozen eggs at a time when you go to the grocery store doesn't seem very generous, especially when you've got a family of seven who can eat through that dozen eggs in one sitting. But perhaps the sense of our present limitation is all the more why we need to state our faith, state our perspective clearly for ourselves as well as for those around us in order to guard against the wrong perspectives that so easily creep into our thinking and cause us to believe that God somehow doesn't have this under his control or that God is not good. So you and I need to hear that the place God assigned to us is good, that day and night, as David says, day and night you instruct me, day and night God has us in his sight so that he can instruct us, he can confront us with his presence, bring us face to face with who he is and with his grace, no matter what happens. There's this picture in the psalm of boundary lines and portions and so on, and it recalls the, when the tribes of Israel first came into the promised land and God gave them their portion, God gave them their place to live, their allotted land as a tribe. And, and I... You know, the Bible doesn't say a lot about people's reaction to that. It just kind of was what, you know, how it was assigned. But I can imagine there was a little bit of people looking at that and saying, well, you know, I, I kind of wanted that territory over there. I, I can't do what I want in, you know, this territory over here. And to be jealous of each other's lot, portion. And it's the same thing for us too, right? It's easy to look at someone else's portion, whether that portion is literally the place that they live or it's material possessions or job skills or life experiences or family and relationships. And we can look at all of that and say, I wish that were mine. It's much harder to trust that God 
can work through the portion that he's given us to bring us face to face with him and with his grace. And yet Easter highlights that very truth, doesn't it? If we were to stand on the other side of the grave on Good Friday and look at the cross and look at the, the, the body of Jesus that's taken down and put in the tomb, it would be hard to see in that a pleasant portion or reason for praise. And Jesus, the human Jesus, was actually honest about that, wasn't he? When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying, Lord, take this cup from me. In other words, God, I knew that you gave me this cup, and it's not a pleasant one, or it doesn't feel pleasant. Yet not, your, not, not my will, but your will be done. Now we can ask, on this side of the grave, what instruction from God could we find in the seemingly meaningless death of a beloved prophet and teacher? How is that refuge or shelter for those who are seeking God? And it's the same in every difficult moment of history, every challenging moment of our lives. Where do we see God at work? Here. Yet with David, we can confidently say that God has a bigger perspective, that God invites us into his perspective of things, one that has the ability to view life from the other side of darkness, the other side of sin and confusion, to show us refuge that is ours on the other side of the grave. And of course, it's the threat of the grave that always lurks in the background somewhere. Now, one of the things I think we've seen in the last month or so is that there's a resurgence of the reality of death. That's kind of sobering. And it's not that we didn't know that death existed before. I mean, we always sort of know this as human beings. And yet, in, in North America, in our Western world, we have the medical technology and, and the ability to kind of forestall death. And, and so we almost create for ourselves the illusion, after a while, that, that even death is something that we can control. I, I read a, a line from... A doctor in Europe here recently, he said, you know, we've, one of our sins is that we have sinned from too much confidence, thinking that this kind of thing could never happen to us. It could never happen here. And now suddenly we face a killer that we can't see. Medical workers and first responders feel that threat, don't they? The threat of taking the virus home with them to those that they love or perhaps bringing it to some place like a nursing home or a prison. We look around and there's not enough protective equipment to keep them safe, to keep them healthy. Maybe there wouldn't be enough protective equipment no matter how much protective equipment there was. We don't know. And it prompts sobering conversations, right? When I was a kid, we knew that if both my parents died, we knew that I would go to live with my aunt and uncle. But it wasn't a conversation that we really had to take seriously. Now, families actually have to think about these things. Now, granted, it doesn't strike younger people quite as frequently as older people, but it's so contagious. What if a mother and a father both get sick? What happens to the family? But one thing that we all know is that every one of us will die, and this brings this a little bit closer. Every one of us is going to die. Every one of us is going to face the Lord, and then what? And then what? You know, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the reality of sin and death. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 3 that the wages of sin is death. Our sin separates us from God. It alienates us from each other. And it's moments like this that we feel this. And this side of the grave, we always feel that threat, don't we? The, the reality of death sort of always looms in the background, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. In fact, this is one of the things that the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus came to experience with us. In Hebrews 2, he writes... Jesus shared in our humanity so that by his death he might free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. There's a certain slavery that happens in thinking that we have to do it all in this life, that there's nothing more out there beyond to look forward to. Yet what the psalmist does is look ahead and to say with confidence, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, for you will not abandon me to the grave. Hear this for a moment. Remember, David is facing a situation where he's starting to ask God, God, give me refuge, give me strength, give me help. And here he says, in the midst of that situation, demanding refuge and security, one who trusts God can rejoice, soul and body. Even our body, which is frail, which is subject to, uh, to injury and disease, even our bodies can rest secure. 
And not even the concern of death can keep believers from living joyfully because there is a confidence that God can overcome even the threat of the grave. I started by talking about refuge. You know, right now, shelter in place is a pretty familiar phrase. It's kind of funny. I think about, until about five weeks ago, I'd never heard this phrase, and now it's all over the place, right? And one main piece of our fight against this virus is the idea that we can try to shelter from it by staying in our place. We can place ourselves outside its reach by creating safe spaces that it hasn't got to yet. Uh, now, that's good medical advice, isn't it? It's one of the reasons that we're trying to, to create space between people and, and, and to avoid uh, spreading virus around by having extra contact with people. There's a reason that there's not many people here in church this Easter Sunday. But the heart, human heart needs more than just a shelter or a refuge from disease or from the circumstances of life. We need a shelter a place that our greater enemy cannot touch. We need a shelter from the devil, from sin, from death. A place that he can't get us anymore. And that's what God gives for us on Easter Sunday. A place to find hope on the other side of the grave, to know that we have a God who will not abandon his people to suffering or even death. And more than anything else, that's what we proclaim on Easter Sunday. God did not abandon his son to the grave and he will not abandon any who trust in this son as their savior. That was the message of the first sermon really ever delivered in the church in Acts chapter 2. Where the apostle Peter stood up among those who heard uh, as the Holy Spirit was poured out in Jerusalem that first Pentecost Sunday. And said, quoted this psalm and said, this is exactly what was true of Jesus. You have not abandoned me to the grave. You did not let your Holy One see decay. And so you will fill me with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We who are dead in transgressions and sins need no longer to fear the power of death. Death which robs us of opportunity to be made right anymore with God and confession and forgiveness. The work of restoring us to God has been finished in Christ. And we can now live with the eternity of hope in Him. A few weeks back, someone had shared a poem on the internet uh, called The Other Side of the Virus, An Opportunity to awaken. And the poem reads in part, yes, there is panic buying. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death. But they say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, you can hear the birds again. They say that after just a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes, but blue and gray and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across the empty squares, keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family around them. Yes, there is panic buying, but there does not have to be meanness. Yes, there is sickness, but there does not have to be disease of the soul. Yes, there is even death, but there can always be a rebirth of love. Today, breathe. Listen. Behind the factory noises of your panic, the birds are singing again. The sky is clearing, spring is coming, and we are always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul, and though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing. Right now, the news cycles tell us nothing but disease and death. And that's what the disciples expected that first Easter Sunday, too, as they came to the grave. The grave was kind of an empty square across which they could not reach. They could not reach the one who delivered the kingdom of God to them. But instead of finding death that day, they found a new song of hope. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. And this morning, we bring that same message to a world full of empty squares and silent factories, a world paused and holding its breath, lest death overwhelm us. He is risen, just as he said. Do not be afraid. And we recall that no disease, no sickness of body or soul, no sin that you've confessed or committed can separate you from the love of God. When you throw your lot in with Christ and with his people, when you view your world from the perspective of one who knows that you are fully in God's care, life and in death, body and soul, when you recognize the power of death without fearing its sting anymore, you have reason to hope. This side of the grave, we may feel a little bit overwhelmed right now with what's going on. 
that Christ has carried us to the other side of the grave, to an unshakable foundation in which we can rejoice forever and even our bodies can rest secure. And so we find, as John Piper puts it, that this psalm can be our song as well, this Resurrection Sunday. He says, God will bring you, body and soul, through life and death to full and everlasting pleasure. If he is your safest refuge, your supreme treasure, and your sovereign Lord and trusted counselor through Jesus Christ, the risen King of Kings. May God open all of our eyes and hearts today to see his glory and his goodness to us, which carries us to the other side of the grave. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice today because in the resurrection, your power spoke new life into a place of death. We confess how easy it is, Lord, to be captivated by the narratives of this world, by promises that if we just throw our lot in with this trend or that hero, or we just think this way, we will find happiness. But we acknowledge, too, the emptiness of any promise but yours. May we this morning put our hope in Jesus Christ, and as we do, we pray that you would fill us with eternal pleasures that come from a life lived in your presence, at your right hand, both now and for all eternity. We pray this in the Spirit's power. Amen.